thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, I'm not very happy of, that I'm, I'm, I'm following right after the music. So, because this will not be music-like at all. Um, actually, today I'm going to tell you fairy tales from a not-so-remote past about communication on a medium that once was very popular and attracted a lot of interest and concern from professional historians. And this medium was called the Internet. It's hardly remembered today amongst you professionals. Um, well, okay, that's probably an exaggeration. But it's not far off to say that the idea of, of, of making what we used to call in the past information systems has gone and has been replaced by more flexible and more mobile devices, participatory approaches, and, a, and, and an orientation towards the space or the location as front end to our presentations. On the dispense, perhaps, of the authoritative storyteller uh, or sender. This spatial turn is interesting as it is re related to the spatial turn in history writing. Space matters, it seems. Today, if you don't possess a smartphone and, uh, or if you're not located in the middle of the actual physical town, you're out of touch with cultural history, or maybe not quite. Let's check if that's true. Let's see what my friends on Facebook have posted within the last days or so. My friends, well not all of them, some of my friends are museum curators, university historians and archivists. And they use Facebook and other social media to promote a variety of methods and of history communication. They're all very good people, of course. And I should say that naturally all of my friends in the cultural history sector are innovative and creative and upbeat, all of them. On Facebook, they communicate on at least two levels. They post links to their own friends, and that is the first level, to links to communication of history and public platforms of various sorts. And that is the second level. Smartphone or other portable devices applications, on location exhibitions, even old school poster exhibitions. They are only acceptable, it seems, if they're taken out of the museum and placed in the open townscape. Videos. In the last week alone, there was a lot of new cultural history videos. I mean, it, and there seems to be a true breakthrough of video communication in our sector these days. So let's see what they are communicating. I've been editing it a bit so you cannot see all of the, all the, all the friends of mine who are not smart and creative <laughs> and innovative. Uh, here's Elaine, she's telling us about, she's, I mean, she's linking to something called the Brighton Pavilion. Uh, it's an online exhibition uh, of the King's Apartments. Um, and here's a link to historic atlas that we were told about or informed about of Anakin earlier on. And there's a link here to the history pin. I've been, I've had the, the, the opportunity to see some of the slides from the presentation that will follow after me, so I will not present the history pin. But my friends, because they are so upbeat, obviously, also linked to the history pin. Here's a good friend of mine, Jakob, who is informing us, his friends, that he has published uh, a new article about poor relief in Aalborg in the 17th century. The article, obviously, is online. Here's an, a website called Denmark's Historian DK, Danish History. Um, and they're linking, this is quite interesting, they're linking, um, and they, have, they have posted a link to a video of two learned scholars, two uh, Danish historians, 
who have been placed in St. Ben's Church, in Ringsted, the old royal church of Denmark. And in this church, they're discussing the true character of Danish crusades in the 12th century. Videos. Here's some of my colleagues at Fire Express City Archives who have um, posted new photos in their photo album called Fire Express Before and Now. Finally, we have uh, the so-called 1001 Stories of Denmark, a uh, website coordinated by the Heritage Agency of Denmark. And this story is about, uh, we call it Hornetor and the Round Tower. I'm not quite sure what the, what the, what the true English uh, word is uh, in Copenhagen. I'm, I'm not going to follow uh, the links, of course, because that would take too much time, but you know the character of it. The final one, the final link that I will uh, um, mention here is a link to a, link to a website showing um, Copenhagen as it was depicted on a map in 1761. This is a sensationally good website, I think. It's brand new. Um, it's presenting presentations that have been inspired by so-called elevated map that was produced, as I said, in 1761. And um, what you see here is map walking. Um, you, have, you even have a 3D reconstruction of some of the central parts of Copenhagen. And then you have videos, lots of videos. I mean, videos really seem to be uh, what's upbeat these days. Right. This is not the whole range of professional historians communicating their work, of course. This is a more or less homogeneous community of Facebook users who share ideas and visions of modern dissemination of history. But what they promote, is my contention, is a vision that mobile, location-based storytelling, preferably on videos or at least um, based on images or photographs, is what we use today when we address the public. And this raises multiple questions, uh, I think, but since I am by no means an expert in these media, I will not take this into a discussion about mobile communication as such. What I will do, however, is to, is to focus on the concept of the city or the urban community. Uh, and discuss if such a, such a concept should be basic when we tell stories or write stories about urban history and take it to the public. Basic, perhaps, even for mobile communication. What image of the town or the city in the distant and not so distant past um, are we building our work, or what images are we building our work on? And does our work reflect what the city is? Today, my challenge to you is to say that most of our display of a city's history, be at an indoor or in an uh, open air museum, reflects a past reality, uh, re reflects perhaps the closed, the walled, medieval or pre modern city, and not today's network based urban community. Is this not how we most often see the city when we communicate urban history at a museum? Uh, a figure um, where all cities have a closed build-up area, and is this not what cities actually are like today? A connectivity of firms, of people, ideas, and educations within a global urban network. Anyway. I will leave this for inspiration and I will talk um, and I will move a little on here. This is where we move a step back, or rather this is where I move a step back and become a bit nostalgic by taking a look on the concept of web communication of the Danish Center for Urban History in retrospect. And this is back in the old internet days that some of you might remember. 
looking at old web pages is like opening your family photo album. It's not certain that you like what you see, but it is you. Um, the center had not existed for a year. We were founded in 2001, before the idea of what became eventually the um, the digital, the digital before the digital town gate was born. The name itself reveals that, reveals the idea of a gate or of a portal. No one speaks about portals today. The first thing we did was to publish a series of lithographs by a Danish officer uh, by the name Peter Grunwald, depicting the journey of King Frederick V in 1749. We showed a number of the pictures on our website and we added some texts and then we called it a web exhibition. And that was it. That was all we did and we liked it. We thought it was very, very good. Maybe it was due to my relative unacquaintance of the physical display of Danish towns of the 18th century because it should not have surprised me, actually, but I was surprised when I saw the pictures by the resemblance between the towns and the town spaces depicted by Grunwald. The notion of market towns being variations of the same theme, or should we say urbanity, became the leading inspirational idea of the, of the digital town gate after that. In 2003, I see from old papers, the idea had advanced so much that I told an audience uh, in Wismar, in Germany, as a matter of fact, the following. And this sounds very old school, but I'm giving it to you. The proliferation of electronic, who says electronic today? Never mind. The proliferation of electronic and above all web resources for historical research has created a growing need for examining the advantages of the new media. We must ask how and for what ends digitized data collections and online web resources should take the place of the old printed versions, be the original documents or publications. The digital town gate is meant to give access to online primary sources uh, to the history of Danish towns and a presentation of key aspects of the Danish urbanization and the cultural environment, or the physical cultural environment, that was one outcome of this urbanization. With the digital town gate, and I'm still quoting, we want to provide both scientists and members of the general public with opportunities to explore and research a selection of the most important aspects of Danish urbanization. For now, the project's time limit is Danish absolutism, that is from 1660 to 1848, a period that witnessed the climax of the urbanity of the classical market towns. <coughs> but the quote reveals the early stages of the ambition to create a, to create a website that was both a source register or database and a container of stories, so to speak. But the text, which I have actually quite enjoyed reading these years, many years later, also re reveals how the understanding of an archetypal early modern Danish town framed the content of the website as it goes on to give a, a, a characterization of the urban system of Denmark. And just a few words on that. I mean, maybe it's a bit dark, but I think it's important anyway. Danish urban settlements possessed a distinctive communality due to a more or less general urban, uh, due to a more or less general cultural environment and shared center place functions. This was a result of the Danish urban system that gave exclusive rights to chartered market towns. A town was simply conceptualized by a legal recognition of city status by the granting of privileges. There was no other way to become a city. The chartered market towns from about 15, 
150, managed to maintain a sort of monopoly, at least, of trade, manufacturing, and shipping in Denmark. In Denmark, this is known, or in Danish historiography, this is known as the mercantile control of the towns. To put it short then, at least compared to today's situation, the towns were very much identical. The point to be made here is that from the smallest to the largest town, we find, or we found, almost the same set of urban institutions. This is hardly a new insight. This is actually the, the exact same idea that the Gamle Bug was and still is based on. The idea of an ideal type of the city, uh, almost like a Danish answer to a Max Weber Greek police. This and, and the well-tested relevance of applying central place theory on regulated economic entities like the early modern Danish town also added to the theoretical frame that we were setting up for the website that we were constructing. Now my plan was to say a little more about databases, but I think you get the picture that because we have an urban system that um, is composed of um, a large number of towns who have uh, si almost similar rights all, and who share almost the same central functions, economic, uh, citizens functions, uh, etc. It's possible, at least we thought it was possible, to, to establish databases that, uh, that contain information from all towns on the same subjects. And it would still make sense to compare the data without much explanation. So there you just uh, got rid of five minutes of database talking. Okay. The pre-modern urban space was well defined as a physical, fiscal, legal, political, and economic space. What is particularly interesting in regard to the early modern town is the close interaction between the town as a physical space and the town as a social, socio-cultural arena. For example, the town's legal and administrative self-rule was in all towns exercised on the arena of the town hall. The raising of town ports fences or even moats everywhere mark the fiscal unity and the, and the boundary of the town. Civic militias mark the autonomy and social aspirations of the citizenry. Hospitals, clubs, secondary schools, prisons, courthouses and many other institutions can likewise be regarded as materializations of a common urban culture. Since they were both restricted to urban societies, you could not find them anywhere else but in towns, and at the same time looked very much the same in all towns. <clears throat> in the previously mentioned paper from 2003, I now see that we were then working with a taxonomy inspired by a Swedish historian called Gregor Paulsson. I'm not going to go through the taxonomy, we have it here and it moves on to here. Um, it has a subdivision, of course. It has some main categories. The productive life is one main category and the public life is the other. And then they have um, subdivisions of that. But we thought it useful at the time, I now see, to have this kind of taxonomy to make an order uh, of the information that we would like to, to share. The taxonomy was a guiding line for us in the work of picking the data to be collected. But we wanted it to be more than that. We wanted to add a meta data structure to all the collections so that, for instance, you could follow a path showing you everything there was on the website about trade or business in a particular town or in all towns leading you through databases about, let's say, town politics, from full text, 
town charters to names and social positions of city council members, or a path through the build-up area or townscape uh, information in the databases, showing you iconic urban symbols like town halls, uh, city gates, public buildings like schools, theatres, hospitals. Much inspired actually um, by an Aldo Rossi-like thinking in urban artefacts. We spent many hours in, in this, uh, at this time of, of, of the process um, trying to define the taxonomy and eventually we made it and uh, the basis of what became a three-dimensional reconstruction of a Danish town of 1830. And this we made in 2006. I hope this will work, just a second. Here we come, right. This was a reconstruction uh, that we made in, uh, as I just said, in 2006. I will come back to what the relationship between this reconstruction of the 3D model and the data collections are. Uh, first, I would just like to present uh, or to inform you that we were still working with a taxonomy. Uh, we still wanted to make uh, an order in, um, in the information that we, were, that we were giving. We had five superior categories. Um, and these are only Danish, I'm afraid, but you can see them. If, and if I take them from the left to, to your right, it would be first power and privileges, then it would be outside the town, then it would be buildings and open spaces, business, people, and finally human culture. <clears throat> As I just said, we used the taxonomy to create an order, but also to clarify to the users that this narrative had a sender. So the model was an illustration of our suggestions of the ideal urban model that most Danish town market towns resembled. And in so being, it was meant for the broad public. Right, I will show you a few, I'll take a path or a route. What I did here, sorry, I'll start from the beginning, sorry. Just a second. It doesn't move so fast here. And for some reason, we only see half of you. Okay. What I, what I did was that at first I chose the main category of power and privileges, and that will take me to places in, in the town that was somehow, and this town is an ideal town. It's not a real town. It's a reconstruction based on, on uh, sources from 1830. It will take us to places in town that were somehow connected or um, it, uh, yes, connected to the theme in question. Power and privileges, uh, that could be courthouses, for instance. It was important for us that we, would, that we could provide the users these, with these tracks. I think one of the previous speakers called it tracks um, through the town to get a coherent uh, experience. show you one more. A piece of curious information. We didn't make this adaptable to Mac. We thought this Macintosh thing and uh, <laughs> hardly had any future, so we didn't do that. So you, can, you cannot use this on your Mac at home. Okay. What did I do? I chose streets. And this took me here to a place, well, everything in the town is connected to streets, you could say. And then you have, will have a text information about uh, the main features of streets in an early modern Danish town. I'll take you on flying for the longest track we had that's outside of the town to the mill. Interesting where we will land. There we are. Okay. And then you have the mill and you have vision over the city, over town. Right. This was, of course, meant for, you could say, the broad public. But it was also 
conceived by us as a first step to make a spatial interface to the data collections. A visual menu, we called it back in 2006. Uh, we wanted that you could step directly from the hotspots. These are the hotspots. Um, from the hotspots in the 3D model to the databases in other parts uh, of the digital town gate. And then eventually you could go directly from the model to a database and, uh, and, and onto a facility where you could borrow a book about the subject in question and had it uh, handed over to you at your local library. That was the idea. What we did not manage to do because this was never realized uh, with the resources that we had, was two things. We never added hierarchical subject headings to the bibliography, for instance, to link the publications automatically to the databases. And we never got to transport, and this is a bit technical, but it was rather important for us. We never got to transport all the data to an SQL server, um, so everything that you will see in a moment on the digital town gate has been tied together by hand, so to speak. And that is perhaps the main lesson to be learned from this. Don't ever tie data together by hand, ever. I don't know if that's what you do at home at night, but don't ever do that. Okay. <clears throat> What's next? Okay. Another thing that was never really completed with the digital town gate, but did, however, I think, contain... No, sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of my presentation here. We had a taxonomy still in what became the final version of the digital town gate. It's not very clear to many people, but you, I hope you will see it on this movie. If it starts uh, rolling in a second, it should do. It didn't. It's just too slow. Anyway, and I will just show you on the internet. Right. Okay. This is the um, this is the front end of the digital town gate, and these are all the collections that you can see li um, listed to your left, and then to to your right you had um, a thematical order which um, it works like this it's quite simple we have, we have just tagged every data collection with a variety of content so to speak so that if you want to see what is there about urban development then you push the button which means urban development and then you sort and then it is uh, and then you get a sorted list of content of the database it's very simple um, sailing for instance, or urban culture, industry, crafts, urban space. What's this? I forgot. What's this about urban space in the collections? Right. Good. Another thing that was never quite um, or really completed, but I think did contain uh, promising aspects, was the integration of digital and printed. Media. This was a thing that we uh, spoke a lot about uh, a few years ago. Two cases, I think, were proofs of the perspectives. In articles that we wrote uh, about economic centrality of early modern towns, a limited number of maps were put as documentation of catchment trade areas. In article, that is. On the website, Similar maps from all towns were placed, including full text or extracts of the sources that had been used for making the map. And this is an illustration of that. Sorry, I haven't got back to that. Here we are. Um, it, it's quite simple, actually. As you left here, this is a book, one of the books that we've been published. In the book, there's an article about economic centrality of Danish towns. In the article we published, for instance, a map showing the situation of the West Jutland town of Varda. But that is only one map that we have had made. In fact, we have made similar maps um, showing the situation of all towns. 
and this map you can find on the website. I think it was a rather good idea of integrating books or um, e-resources like that. <coughs> anyway, um, but these cases, I think, never really were quite successful still. And I think the main reason for that was that they were made before the breakthrough of the e-book. I think it would prove to be different and more successful if we launched it today. Anyway, so this was either premature or experimental, if you like. That's up to you to judge that. But that's one of the things that we, one of the features that we, uh, that we, we developed on the website that was never really successful. Okay, so what can you find on the digital uh, uh, town gate? I will give you an example. What can you find about Singletown? And this is the town of, of Horsens. And it should start a movie, but it doesn't. For some, for some reason, the um, computer doesn't support it. And I do it in hand. Okay. Just a second. On the front page of our um, website, you can choose a city you would like to find information about. And I choose horses. What's there about horses? And first you get um, a general survey of the history of horses. It's written here. And then underneath that, you will have, uh, you will see how horses is represented in the data collections of the website. The first website here is about uh, maritime trade and, um, um, and shipping. And the next one is about the same. This, is a, um, this one you should see because this is the first one we made. It's the oldest data collection or web exhibition we had. It's about uh, market uh, town halls. Uh, it's a very simple database. So this shows the, 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 the registered town halls of, uh, of horses of, of the period. And then um, the functions that, were, uh, that have been documented to have been placed at the town hall in questions. Um, if you follow the functions, it says functions here, then you can get a list of all other town halls where you find the same functions. Um, so this is a very simple database, but it was one of the first that we made. Um, and then you can link it directly to pictures of town halls carrying the same functions, so to speak. Right, that's just one thing. Back to this. Here's the database about urban agriculture. Um, this is about monuments. This is full text versions, or uh, this is a, actually these sources, um, uh, these are full text sources. They are based on a questionnaire that was sent out by, by the Danish government in the year 1735 to all towns and town magistrates. Um, and we had them transcribed. This was an early experiment of what you could call user participatory participation, because we simply ask out in the public who would like, uh, if any, uh, to help us transcribe these documents. And actually some people responded. And I can see one here today, actually. Charlotte Lindhardt responded. He was, he was one. You transcribe a lot of these texts. Um, and after transcribing them, we uh, XML coded them. And we, and we tagged them with the information. Because the problem with historical sources like this or like these is that you cannot make a free text search because the spelling is so much different from the spelling of today. So you have to make a normalization of data. So we did that as well. And um, this, that was one of the projects that uh, I was most fond of, actually. I'm not going deeper in, inside the actual content of the digital town gate. <coughs> right. Um, in the meantime, actually, before we had finished working with the early modern town, we had begun working on the successor, the industrial town. In Denmark, there was a high degree of continuity 
from the pre-industrial to the industrial urban system, at least what you can call location continuity. The, leading town, the leading towns remain the same, but the privilege to find rural dependence of urban economy uh, was losing to manufacturing economy. Um, towns began to differentiate more. <clears throat> but still we wanted to make another virtual interface to the data collections of the modern urban history. But then we chose not to reconstruct a town or a city. Just a second. Right. We chose not to reconstruct a town or a city, but a representation of modern urbanism instead. And this became the so-called the Virtual National Exhibition of 1909. Thomas actually mentioned it in his presentation. This is the 3D reconstruction of a great fair or exhibition site in Aarhus. We considered it to be too difficult to make a representation of a whole town uh, as such, given the complexity and the sprawl of the urban site that had begun at that time. We're still working with a taxonomy of uh, a town, I see here. We're still working with a composition of, in this case, business enterprise, infrastructure, leisure, people and social relations, and finally, events, uh, governance and social life. This is a movie uh, of a navigation, of one possible navigation or track through the 3D model of the virtual uh, national exhibition. The idea here was to place hotspots inside the model. Hotspots uh, showing stories um, that we consider to be central. The story says colonies, foreign trade or colonial trade. And here we have the first house of the old town. And then finally, we are clicking on one of the hot spots as we get photos of the original site. As you probably or maybe not could see, you could also have chosen to see a text or a written, uh, a written, written presentation of the site. The virtual natural exhibition is meant to be a landscape of information, giving access to a representation of sources, photographs, texts, sound and movie bites. Um, you did not hear the sound and movie bites here or see them, but they are there. In other words, it was meant to be an interface or a spatial browser, which not only provides the user with information, but hopefully also with a more intense and augmented feeling of the, of the physical proportion of the site. And this, I should add, is of course the goal or the intention of all 3D reconstructions. In order to make the model into a window to the history of the modern city, we consistently divided the information into two levels, one telling the history of the exhibition, the other telling our interpretation of how the exhibition reflected the situation of urban life in the year of 1909. This dual purpose meant that we gave up using the same taxonomy as we used in the 1830 model. Instead, we made the division I showed you previously into five categories. The early modern town, and I'm getting moving closer to the end now, 
The early modern time was a relatively static universe. It meant that we could make a universal representation of it, or at least we could claim that we could do that. The industrial city represented here by the National Exhibition was a challenge. Now, what about the post-industrial city? The Center for Urban History has not yet begun communicating the most recent urban past on the web. But in other formats, of course, the center has an understanding of the characteristics of the post-industrial city. Not that it differs anything or much from the mainstream understanding of what the post-industrial city is like. Because as we all know, the revitalization of the cities and the mobile labor market of that we see from after, let's say, 1990, has led to a situation where the link between production and settlement has become increasingly less clear cut. One could say that the spatial dependence has become less relevant. There is no longer total correspondence between people's social and economic life worlds. Residents workplace, shopping, education and cultural activities are no longer tied together by the unity of place. If that is today's urban life, then how do we ensure that our history communication corresponds to that? How will we in the future reflect the networks and the separateness of life worlds that constitute modern urbanism? One thing is certain, I think, transforming modern urban life into a 3D model, like the ones we have been seeing here, would be a, very, a rather difficult task. I cannot help thinking that today's growing use of mobile technology and geographically coded history information uh, are somehow a part of this urbanism and not necessarily a critical comment to it, as we normally would like the humanistic studies to be. I say this because the mobility of communication fits into a larger picture. I'm thinking of the intentions that are behind the creation of urban space today. Once, during absolutism, urban space was dominated by the intention of creating classical monumentality. And this was followed by the young welfare society's emphasis on representation and services with all the town halls and libraries and schools and hospitals, etc. Now we have a post-industrial urban space and we have space politics that emphasize experience and residential and architectural quality. Telling people about a distant past in, in, in which a town or a city was a walled community, suddenly one day will be, will be difficult for us. It will be out of touch with uh, the reality of our public. There's nothing wrong with that in a way. It will, just, it will just provide a challenge for us in the future as people will perhaps forget what a city used to be like. We'll forget that once a city was an actually defined area in which you lived your whole life. You worked there, you married there, you spent your full time in your city. The challenge would be how to make a context, I think, for all the history information that we pump into circulation. We even expect or in encourage people to compete our collections and narratives with their own data their life stories or their own photographs or videos. It can be done, probably, and it's, I'm, I think that the 1001 story of Denmark project has a fine contextualization. And that's great in many ways, and I'm in no way opposed to that. Um, the key word is presence in these efforts, personal belonging and identity are other key words. We encourage people to search for their own history in the city. We send them walking through town 
and we give them a sense of the past that lie beneath their feet or that stands in front of their faces. And we hope to create a kind of spatially bonded personal emotions. I'm just saying that if we are not careful, it will remain just that, personal and individual and not collective. That does not mean that I'm a pessimist. Other people are more pessimistic than I am. This guy, for instance. Thank you very much. <laughs>